Hey everyone, it's Denise Brown from the Caregiving Years Training Academy. Thank you so much for being with us. I am thrilled and honored to introduce you to the Caring Award category winners in the Caregiving Support category, the Caring Leaders category, and the Grief Support Program category. So we're gonna introduce you to the winners in each of those three categories. They're all here tonight. And thank you guys all so much for being here. I'm gonna just quickly tell you who the winners are, and then we're gonna start with a more um, detailed conversation with the winners. So in the caregiving program category, LEARN, which is the Lifelong Education and Aging Resource Network in Boise, Idaho One, and representing them tonight are Mary and Tina. So we'll meet Mary and Tina in just a minute. And then the other winner is a course called Learning the Ropes, which was developed by Beth Campbell Duke. And Beth is here with us tonight as well. And then we have three caring leaders. So Tamara Jovel from the Area Age, oh, sorry, the Mid East Commission Area Agency on Aging. She's the Family Caregiver Resource Specialist, is one of our caring leaders. And then Barbara Corley and Diane Glittenberg are two of our caring leaders, and they won for developing in their spare time on the weekends a direct care worker training program. And then Kathy Murray, who is a certified caregiving consultant and grief movement specialist, won in the grief program category. Okay. Ah, so <laughs> let's talk about learn. Okay. So Tina and Mary, why don't you guys go ahead and unmute yourselves and Mary, let's start with you. I would love to learn a little bit more about your work and then tell us a little bit about what your work is with learn. Sure. Um, well, first off, thank you so much for having us. And it certainly is an honor and a privilege um, to be an award recipient and to be recognized. So my name is Mary Malott, and I am the uh, professional education uh, chair for Learn Idaho. And by day, I am the senior community engagement specialist with Molina Healthcare of Idaho. And that is part of the way that I got in, involved um, with LEARN. Um, but for those of you not familiar with LEARN, um, as uh, Denise mentioned, it is an acronym for Lifelong Education and Aging Resource Network. And our um, it, it was formed in uh, Boise, Idaho in um, the early part of 2020. Actually, we started talking about it in 2019 and it was formed in 2020. We're a nonprofit uh, organization. Um, and our mission is helping people navigate the joys and challenges of aging and uh, caregiving. And our vision is serving as a trusted uh, source of information and resources for the community by the community in the areas of health, wealth, caregiving, lifestyle. And though we're already doing it with Tina uh, technology, but we're going to be officially adding that um, as one of our pillars. Um, so at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Tina and uh, let her talk a whole lot more about LEARN. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary. And, and thanks, Denise. It's really exciting to receive this award. So I'm on the board of directors, and I am the technology uh, education program manager. So we have a new uh, program that um, began in um, April of last year. Um, my focus uh, with LEARN is to uh, teach technology to older adults, and our program is kind of off to a great start. We've been um, uh, serving older adults at a senior center locally in, in Boise and expanding the program hopefully uh, later in the year. So um, that's just uh, my little piece of the, the program, and I'm a certified senior advisor, which is how I found uh, Learn Idaho, which is a, 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 sort of a society of uh, certified senior advisors uh, leadership network group. So yeah, thank you for having us. So one of the things that I, it just really touched me when I read the nomination for your organization is that you're a group of volunteers who were inspired to make a difference. Now, anyone knows that a group of volunteers inspired to make a difference sometimes simply stays inspired, <laughs> that you never go to the next step, which is to take action. 
and to stay cohesive in mission and to stay on target with mission too. Uh, so Mary, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you were able to come together as a group and then work effectively as a group? Sure. So somebody who um, is our leader, Dara Ray, um, is unfortunately not able to be here uh, tonight. And, Lee, and Dara really, she is the brainchild behind uh, LEARN. Uh, Dara is celebrating um, two of her children's graduations. One just graduated high school, one just graduated college. So uh, she is on a very well-deserved and earned uh, vacation and family celebration. Uh, but Dara came up with uh, the idea to gather uh, individuals who are uh, caregivers themselves or work with and provide services to individuals who are caregivers. Um, she personally, you know, has experienced uh, the caregiving role many times in her life. She's put together My Data Diary, My Care Companions as an information um, resource and, and, and information management um, tool. Um, she attended various meetings throughout the Treasure Valley in Idaho and um, national meetings. And something she found was that a certain piece of things were missing. And she wanted to, find, to take those certain pieces and create learn. And so she reached out to um, you know, people that, that she knew and asked uh, for their um, interest and their engagement, um, and then also asked them to suggest other people. And she came up with ideas and came up with the kind of framework for our mission and our vision. But then as she gathered all of these individuals, we all put our input into it and then decided on what are the most meaningful things? What are those things that we can do um, to take action and to make a difference and fill those niches and um, reduce um, those gaps um, within our community? So Tina, if there is an organization watching this or an individual watching this thinking, oh my gosh, we need to do something like this in our community, what what would you recommend they do for first next steps? Well, that's a good question. Um, I have Dara Ray um, decided that she wants to do that. Um, you know, it's really, she's been a, a real force of nature. Um, it, it does take um, really strong leadership, which we have benefited from with, with Dara at the helm. Um, and then I think, uh, that the other secret for our 100% volunteer organization is a really active board. We are the backbone, we are the organization and um, we meet monthly uh, to basically run the organization to, to connect. There are committees, subcommittees uh, like Mary's um, community education and professional education. Um, and so each person has a, a very important role there. Uh, I'd say that we're all very invested in uh, the success of the organization. And then, um, you know, it's been really wonderful, if, especially because the organization was formed, you know, kind of right at the beginning of the pandemic um, that we have mixers. So we get together now in person um, quarterly where we're able to interact, see each other's faces, Change, uh, exchange business cards, talk about what we're doing, uh, promote the organization. So it, it's it's been a, um, a lot of uh, pieces like that coming together, but under the direction of, of Dara. So I think that anybody who's watching this is really, really wants to know more. So I'm wondering, Mary, if you could give us the website for Learn, so that sure. anyone interested can go to learn more. Yeah, it is www.learnidaho.org, and the website is a plethora of information, including over 100 uh, videos by uh, professionals that are geared uh, toward any of those areas around health, wealth, lifestyle, caregiving, technology. Um, and it really is by the community, uh, for the community, and, and uh, just a great resource uh, you know, for individuals, regardless of where they are on their caregiving 
uh, journey. Okay, and it's learn Idaho, all one word, dot org. Correct. Mm -hmm. And Tina just popped it in the chat. Yeah. Mary and Tina, thank you guys so much for all that you do for being here with us tonight and really sharing this really inspiring mission. I just, again, I'm so touched by the idea that a group of people got together as volunteers to make a difference. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I, I want to add one thing to what Tina mentioned. Um, so we did start talking about this in 2019, right? Had our first meeting in uh, 2020, became a nonprofit. Um, we had our first three meetings, January, February, March, our professional member uh, meetings. At the meeting, our the, the meeting on um, Thursday, um, whatever it was, the second Thursday in March was the day that basically everything was announced that everything was shutting down, right? We never, we have never missed a member meeting. We have never missed a member meeting. We immediately pivoted to virtual. Um, and as Tina mentioned, our committed board, committed members, um, and all of the people that have, have joined um, you know, the journey, plus all of the individuals who have gathered and been able to use information. Um, from our website and from the in-person um, activities. So thank you so much for recognizing this and, and, and just, just making us just really feel good about the great work that we're doing. Thank you, thank uh, you, thank you. I just wanna let you know it was a no-brainer. It was a no-brainer, it was a no-brainer. Cause I know what it's like to get a group of people together. I mean, that is hard work, that is hard work. So kudos to all of you guys, kudos. Okay, all right, so let's turn to Beth. Beth, do you want to unmute yourself? Okay, there so Beth, you created a course called Learning the Ropes. So you're our international flavor. So you're from, yes. you're from Canada and you really wanted to create a course that helped others, other family caregivers in Canada learn how to navigate the healthcare system. Yeah. And so you turned this idea into a course. You actually did it. Yay. Yay. And you know what? I want to let you know, as someone who creates a lot of courses, that is hard to do. It's intimidating. It is overwhelming and sometimes maybe a little frustrating. So what kept you moving? Even I'm sure as you were like, oh gosh, what do I do next? What do I add next? How do I do this? What kept you going? Well, um, I should probably drop that. Um, I taught high school science for 10 years. So. Oh, there you go. <laughs> You could have just said I taught high school. That I taught high school. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that was exactly that's what got me thinking this way. So it was a development and an iteration. Um, my husband is a lung transplant recipient. So um, prior to that, I mean, his health was going downhill, 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 and we got him through the transplant pre-assessment stage. Um, which took six months. There's quite a lot involved when you're going for an organ transplant. Um, lots and lots and lots of testing and imaging. If you've got a body part, they will take a look at it. Um, so we did that and we were relatively isolated. Like that's a big issue for me in my caregiving journey. So I'm a family caregiver too. Um, we were pretty geographically isolated, like not too terribly bad, but we were a good 45 minutes an hour from one place, two hours plus to the larger centers where he had to go for testing. Um, and so we were kind of alone and then he got the transplant and we landed in, um, it was in Vancouver. There are five centers in Canada that do lung transplants. Um, and then you land in a little community. So you're, you're cohorted with the people who have had transplants at the same time. So I'd gone through all this transplant assessment with him. Um, and, I, you know, I could decipher some of the technical stuff and we'd sorted it all out. But then we landed in a group. So, A, we got support there, which was key for us. Um, but I noticed other people really struggling um, with some of the printed materials, um, how to make sense out of what was being presented to them. And there's a lot of complex things to learn after a transplant. There's uh, complicated medications, et cetera. Um, and that's when the little bell went off, like the science teacher had. It was like, oh, we could just fix up some of these things. And so where this began was a companion workbook to use with 
that people could use along their way, to, that they could use with the information they were being provided by their transplant clinic. And then um, I became more and more involved locally um, with um, some networking groups and things and realized, hey, this it's not just transplant patients who have these sorts of things. Um, it's all kinds of complex and chronic um, care patients and their family members. There's an awful lot to learn um, as you go through a health care issue. Um, you know, and I did some reading and things. There's a, a book called uh, Why We Revolt the, um, by a man called Dr. Victor Montori. And it's yes. about the patient revolution for kind and careful care. And um, one of the things he talks about is new work. So there's a lot of new work that falls to patients and caregivers in their journey. Things that when the system was created, we didn't have to do. And this new work is not really talked about. It's just kind of, here's another thing for you to do. Here's another thing for you to do. Some of it's not even explicitly told to you. Um, and there's no training. And I thought, well, you know, I would already developed this workbook. Maybe I could um, alter it. Um, and that's what I did. And I had a website and I found some learning software and <laughs> figured out how to work it and <laughs> translated it into an online course. So. Yeah, that's how I got there. It didn't happen overnight, that's for sure, especially as a one woman band, right? I'm sitting here so jealous of the people who have teams of volunteers and thinking, I'm listening. How did you do that? <laughs> how did you get more people? Yeah, it's so, awesome. Yeah. yeah. I think we should probably do a forming your team of volunteers, uh, what would you call it? Pop up meeting where we all think about what do we need a volunteer for? How do we recruit them? Because mm -hmm. I, I think there's just such value in organizing and inspiring a group of people to make a difference. Yeah. So sure. Beth, at the end of your course, how do you want your training program participant to feel? Um, I think I want people to feel less overwhelmed with all of this new work that even if things are difficult, like I say, the healthcare system's not in great shape. It wasn't in great shape prior to COVID, and it's certainly in worse shape now. We have some significant, significant issues in Canada. Probably everybody does. Um, so we're not going to fix that overnight. But what we can do is help people understand how the systems are functioning. What is some of the new work, especially if it's unspoken? Um, and here are some support resources. I would love to get to start to get people on board because then those people become peer navigators and sharing somebody's always got an answer or a resource to throw in um, to help another person out so i'd just like for people i guess to feel supported and less overwhelmed with everything yeah and i love the framing that you're providing for us it's around the new work that has been delegated to us. And it's interesting if you think about us as family caregivers, we are the largest group of healthcare providers who are also volunteers. Yeah. We are volunteers and yet we provide the bulk of the work in the healthcare system and in the community system too. Yeah. I'm gonna ask you Beth to put your website address in the chat room. Oh, no. And then I'm also gonna ask you ask you to listen to this question too. So I'm asking you to multitask and that is, okay, so you've got your first course. You know what you want to achieve with your first course. What's your second course? Um, I think the second course is to provide more ongoing support. So the first course is designed to be you sign up. I've, I've put it as free because I've got other things I'm trying to do. You know, I've got day work and all of that. Um, but it would be nice to be able to start to build that community. Um, it, like, like what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> we have to um, be inspired to do it, right? So we look to what others are doing and that inspires us. It's important. That's right. Yeah. Well, one of the activities or the lessons in this course is about developing your support networks. And I think that's where I'd like to go next is to really take that on. Because for, as I said, for us, that feeling of isolation was 
was that was massive for us and had a huge negative impact. So I think that's my next step. Okay, so anyone who's interested in taking Beth's free course, and I would suggest it's for those who live in Canada, but you would benefit from it regardless of where you live, and it's free, so why not take it? Yeah. it so Beth's website is navigatinghealthcare.ca. Correct. And Beth is also an active member on Tearing Our Way, our community on Mighty Network. So if you want to co connect with Beth, you can also join us on Caring Our Way. And she'd be happy to connect with you there. Okay, Beth, thank you. Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. This has been so great. And having the recognition is so supportive, right? Like when I know, I know. I know it's so awesome. You get a little logo, you can tell everyone. It's really and it's well deserved. So kudos. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So Tamara, we're gonna go to you next. And the person who nominated you is here with us today. So Carolyn is one of the family caregivers that you helped in North Carolina. And Tamara, just a reminder to everyone, you are the Family Caregiver Resource Specialist at Mideast Commission Area Agency on Aging. So what came out of Carolyn's letter and her sister-in-law's insights about you, Tamara, is that you are really passionate about helping and supporting family caregivers. I wonder if you could tell us what fuels that passion. Oh, you're muted. Unmute. There we go. There we I had go. It so, yes. Yeah, I had it so that I could see everybody because um, I wanted to see everybody, but I'm going to leave it where I, there we go. Now I can see everybody again. Sorry about that. Um, and I've never actually had it with the window in there. I'm actually covering Barbara Corley, uh, which I've never had a Zoom meeting where that happened. Anyway, it's the caregivers um, as the, I mean, everything about what I do is in the name. It's the Family Caregiver Support Program. I'm the Family Caregiver Resource Specialist. And a lot of people who call, uh, who learn about me to find out, you know, what can you do for us? They all, they think that the care recipient is, they're asking for services for that person. They want to know what they're eligible for, what they can get, what's out there for them. And I always have to emphasize and reemphasize that the caregiver is my client and I don't provide services directly to the care recipient. Um, the care recipient certainly benefits from it when it's, you know, certain programs like supplemental supplies and all that kind of good stuff, provisions of safety equipment and whatnot. But it, my job, I nutshell it by saying is to um, help the caregiver take care of his or herself so they can continue to care for their person. Um, and I try to be careful because it's not always a loved one, even if it's family, it's not always a loved one. I, so I've started saying their person. Um, sometimes it's a neighbor, a church family member, a church friend. So um, I've started saying person because it sounds better than care recipient. Um, so it's the caregivers because the caregivers that, that continue to come back to the caregiver support group meetings, which I love that the, the word support has come up a tremendous number of times. Um, the support group meetings kind of significantly changed due to the pandemic. We went to conference calls and then um, Judy's group, the Beaufort County Caregiver Support Group was smart enough to say, hey, can we do Zoom? So I was doing Zoom with that support group, which stayed completely active, albeit a little bit smaller, but active during the pandemic. We went from conference calls to Zoom meetings. Um, then it was like conference calls and Zoom meetings for those who didn't know the technology. Thank you. Um, for training and getting that out there, Miss Beth. Oh, wait, was that? No, that was Tina, uh, the technology person. Thank you, Tina, for getting that out there. Um, it's so, so important. Um, and now all six of the caregiver support groups that I facilitate are Zoom and in person. We're keeping the Zoom because there are still a lot of folks who, A, just discovered that it's more convenient to stay at home and B, prefer to stay at home because of the uh, person that they're caring for, or there are some still who um, have some fears, still real fears about contracting a virus. And I can appreciate that. And so we just try to provide it in the way that meets them where they are. Let's so, say, 
the caregivers. Let's say tomorrow morning you wake up and you get an email and in your email, it says you have been awarded a $5 million grant that you can use at your discretion. Okay, so what do you do? Um, start a foundation start a foundation because it needs to be like, it has to be bigger than my world. It has to be bigger. You know, every county in the United States is covered by an area agency on aging. So in North Carolina, that's a hundred counties. Well, there are, you know, 50 states and they're all serving caregivers who they have different faces and they have different reasons for being caregivers. But a lot of the stories are the same. Um, the predictable progression of decline for somebody with Alzheimer's is universal. Um, so it would need to be a foundation that really could just get outside my world. You know what I mean? Because they're we're rural, but there's like more rural and worse rural than my five counties. Where and I, to imagine that for some of my caregivers that there's actually somebody out there who has access to less. I know they're out there, and I don't have control over all of that. But I think with the foundation, it could at least have some kind of significant impact. Okay, so let's say you have to name one challenge you're going to use the funding for in your first year. So what's Ooh. the cha what's the challenge that you solve? Oh, God, there's really too many. That's like saying who's your favorite child or pet. Um, uh, there aren't too many things that you would name that I would say I could have just one thing. And I, I would not be able to do that with this. What I would have to do with the foundation is like they did is to form a really smart board of directors to say, okay, we're, there's going to be a core and then we're going to, you know, start putting our planets around that and just try to make sure that we don't get, try to get so universally wide that none of it has an impact on any one thing because we're trying to do everything. So we'd have to find whatever the cores probably like they did, what the core things are. And then um, as we learn, we change. But, you know, you said, did you say 5 million or 5 billion? <laughs> I could say either one. Let's say 5 okay. billion. <laughs> well, because when you invest that and that money grows, then your program or your, um, uh, your organization can grow with the money too, so that you can you know, spread it a little bit wider because there's so many caregivers have so many needs. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how little money you have. Not being able to leave the house is not being able to leave the house. Um, I, I mean, whew, med if Medicare would do what I want them to do, um, it, it still wouldn't put me out of a job, but it would certainly help caregivers. And, and part of that is really just recognizing the second patient in the room and providing the, the care for the caregiver as part of the Medicare, the diagnosis, yeah. a number of ADLs, just like it would be for a, a long-term care policy. If you're eligible through a long-term care policy to go into a facility or if your spouse is in their policy, then Medicare should automatically provide some respite in the home. Um, so, or maybe, maybe I could pay off a few, um, you know, politicians. <laughs> I can use the money to do that, to get that done, right? Because I think that would have such a powerful impact on caregiving in America. That's called lobbying. So we're just going to pivot from paying right. off to lobbying. <laughs> right. So, so then, then hire the lawyer that can, you know, run our lobby. You know what? Yeah. So you're actually giving me an idea. Our certified caregiving consultants actually do a after the diagnosis planning session. So a family mm -hmm. member receives a diagnosis, that family caregiver is impacted, but no one ever talks to the family caregiver about the impact. Right. So they after the diagnosis planning I session. Do. <laughs> okay, there you go. Right, you do. Right. I you know what I meant in the healthcare system. I right. Right. The rest of us do, but in the healthcare system, it's here's my card, come back in six months yes. for another appointment. But there's no true meeting right. with the family caregiver. And I think Medicare paying for that kind of meeting would be life-changing for the family. And I, I have my just one thing um, that I uh, share with professionals, especially in the healthcare industry. And I'm, I'm lucky enough that when they get residents at Monk Geriatric Center, part of the ECU healthcare system in Greenville, that I get to go and talk to the residents and share resources. And I tell them the just one thing 
uh, thing that I have, which is that if you are speaking with someone and, and there's a caregiver, that the one thing you need to tell them is about me or about the Council on Aging or about the Department of Social Services or just one of them, because we're all interconnected and working with each other and we're part of all these you know, um, aging coalition and the P resource connection and the ECRC and the BCRC, and we're all interconnected. So if they just tell, tell them about one of us, then they're going to get connected to all of us. And that's all, just tell the caregiver just one. That's my just one thing thing. And I'm, I'm trying to spread it. And I, I tell all the professionals when you meet a caregiver, just tell them about one, just one. Yeah, yeah. Tamara, it's great to meet you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Congratulations. Thank you, Thank you Judy. Thank you, Carolyn. It's nice to see both of you because um, it has thank been a minute. You. But, uh, thank you for, I read everything you wrote. So thank you for that. Yeah. And Judy, <laughs> it's you, nice to, yeah, Judy, it's nice to meet you. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Nice, this lady nice to see y'all. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a minute, Tamara. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to move to Barbara. Can Denise, can you mute me so I don't have to sure. keep, yeah, put absolutely. my finger up in y'all's faces? Yeah. Thank you. So we're going to move to Barbara. She's also one of our caring leaders, and she was awarded with a colleague, Diane Glittenberg. Diane couldn't be with us tonight. So Barbara's going to do the heavy lifting for both. Mm. Here's the story of Barbara and Diane. So we had funding for training for a direct care worker and we were working on the training and the funding got pulled. And I said to Diane and Barbara, you know, the funding got pulled. I'm not sure if you still want to do this. And they said, of course we do. Let's meet next Sunday, basically is what they said. So we met at the weekends to develop the curriculum and then to record the, the training, which will be available. I got a little delayed this week with a caregiving situation, but it'll be available on Monday. And the reason that we started with this is because Barbara called me and said, I think we have something really compelling to offer direct care workers. What do you think? And so the conversation started last fall and has really, you know, sprung into this specific training for direct care workers, which helps them prepare for a client support a client, and then adjust after a relationship with a client ends, whether it be because of the death or because benefit, benef benefits end, but there's an impact on the direct care worker. So Barbara, tell us about why it's so important for you to have this kind of training for direct care workers. Wow. Um, I mean, honestly, it, it hits home for me. So I have been an active, I am an active family caregiver. I've been a caregiver since I generally say four. Um, I have a younger sister who was born healthy and contracted bacterial meningitis at the age of five months and um, was left basically spastic quadriplegic, developmentally delayed um, 24 hour care. So being the only other sibling, uh, she lives with my parents. So I've been throughout full-time job, married life, working, you know, working full-time college, I've always been involved in her care. We have had direct care workers um, in our home and we've struggled to the, with that to the point where we just rallied the troops and it's just a family organism basically now caring for her. Because I'm the only sibling in the future, when my parents are no longer, I am going to need help. I, I'm willing to step up and say that I'm not, you know, I, I don't foresee myself being able to do it all. Um, I had worked for corporate for corporation was furloughed in 2020 and became a certified caregiving consultant with Denise. And when my furlough was extended, I chose not to return. And I took the path of caregiver consultant. And I, my first thought was I'm going to focus on family caregivers, which I still do to, uh, I get calls here and there. I happened to mention it to my County board of developmental disabilities and said, Hey, guess what I'm doing? And they said, Oh my goodness, we need to talk. So it has since, Oh, what is it now in 2021 that shifted into a role where I mentor 
direct care workers in my county to help get them certified for Medicare waiver services to provide services for folks with developmental disabilities. So ultimately I'm helping to train and mentor the people who may, I'm paying it forward to the, po to the population that hopefully will be there to help me with my sister in the future. Um, I don't do it to pay it forward because I think I'll need it in the future. I do it because I've been a direct support professional since 1990. I live this. Um, I know the system. And so I help them through the complicated, like Beth said, it's a complicated system. Everything you said, Beth, I resonated with. The Medicare, the whole medical system is just as complicated as dealing with a government agency with funding. Um, it's heavy lifting and they are so thankful to have somebody to reach out a hand and say, I'll walk you through this. I'll sit with you while you do it if you want. Um, so that's just really, I mean, it, it's, it's touched my life in many different areas. Um, and it's, it's been completely divinely guided to get me where I am today. I could never have foreseen this path. And I'm stunned to be sitting here amongst all these amazing people oh. with all these amazing goals. I was like, um, I forget who said it earlier. I think it might have been Tamara said, I was shocked by the email. I, I was too. I read it twice and I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> I just, I was just stunned. I'm, I'm still speechless. I'm, I'm honored and I'm speechless to be among these, these great ladies, all these great ladies, these great teams of people. I know. Yeah. We should also mention that Diane is a former family caregiver for her parents. And she also does training for a home care agency. So she was in many ways, the other side of direct care workers. So yes. Barbara might work with a family caregiver who's also a direct care worker for a family member. And so Diane does the training. So she was able to really bring this real world experience of how different is the training we're developing than the training that's already out there? Because we didn't want to recreate what's out there. We wanted to really mm. look at how do we support the direct care worker knowing that that's the individual who's going to establish a relationship with the client. How do we ensure that the direct care worker is empowered to establish the best relationship possible? And then when that relationship ends, how do we support that direct care worker? And that's really what we've developed. So it's just about five hours. We talk about the relationship that's built. We talk about how a direct care worker navigates all these systems. We talk about compassion fatigue, getting really specific about what a direct care worker might grow tired of. And one of the fatigues is cheerleader fatigue because Barbara shared when we were developing the training that she sometimes is weary at the end of the day with her sister always cheering her, you can do it, let's try, you can do it. <laughs> and that would be the life of a direct care worker, right? Always cheering, you can do it. So we talked about how do you heal when you have cheerleader fatigue? And then we also help a direct care worker create a family emergency plan because we know that dependability and reliability is a challenge. And we want that direct care worker to feel like there's a plan in place in, in case something happens so that they still are that dependable, reliable resource for the family and the client. What did I miss, Barbara? Did I get it? I think all? you hit it. I think you hit it very well. I think that the beauty of this, the beauty of the program that we pulled together is that at least, and I, and I, I don't wanna speak for Diane, I'm going to assume it's the same. With the, with the caregivers that I work with, most of them just have a heart of gold and they step into this. They've never met someone with developmental disabilities, but they want to step in and try. They want to help. They have a, they have a, a, care, a caregiver heart. Um, all of the training that they receive, if any, I work with independents. So basically once they become certified, they're, self, they're basically a small business. They're self-employed. They have no training. The, any training they get is specific to the client. I mean, I've had them ask me, well, I want, you know, what should I do about dinner with the client? They don't even feel comfortable or know they have the right to ask family, what role would you like me to play? Those little nuances. So there's such a huge, there's just a huge void to support them. Um, and I'm hoping that I'm hoping it's well received. I'm just, I hope if it helps one person, I'll be thrilled. But um, I really think it's, it, it stands to make a really, a big impact because 
it's all customized generally to, I mean, just like everyone else has said, it's all about the patient or the client. In my case, it's not about the caregiver. Um, so I'm just tapping into the different level of caregiver. It could be family, it could be a non-family. And we really looked at it from the perspective of what's the day like of a direct care worker. So thinking of the first day they start with a new client, what's it like to move into that home, that environment where the client lives? And then thinking about where do I put my purse? Where do I put my lunch? Those kinds of things that seem so basic, but yet can be anxiety producing. Where do I put my lunch? <laughs> where do I put my coat? So thinking about how does that direct care worker integrate into a new space, carve out a little space for themselves, and then establish that relationship, and then feel supported about establishing that relationship, and that's the goal. We really wanted to feel like the direct care worker had us walking with them throughout the day, remembering our words and our suggestions and our insights, and that's the goal. So we're gonna put it out there for free. We're not gonna charge. We really want direct care workers to tell us what they like, what they don't like, what they'd like us to add or improve. But I think for me, what meant so much to me was we really thought we had funding for this. And then when it turned out we didn't, I could understand how someone would say to me, Denise, I'm not going to meet with you on a Sunday <laughs> at 11 o'clock in the morning to put together this training over a period of two months. I mean, it wasn't just once we met, we met regularly, but they said, oh no, we're in it. We are here to do this. And it was really, it was really just a powerful experience. We had so much fun doing it. And we're really committed to making it something that is truly empowering and transformational for the direct care worker. Absolutely. So that's why you won, Barbara. And Tony, that's <laughs> why yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, I'll also make it available for you guys too, if you wanna see what it's like. I'd be happy to share a link with you so you can see what we developed. You don't have to watch all of it. You can go in and out and that's okay with us. Okay. So we're going to close with Kathy. So Kathy is a certified caregiving consultant and grief movement specialist. And when we do an event, Kathy always submits a proposal to present. She is so generous with her time and her presentation is 25 minutes of grief movement. And the reason she won is because she is a fan favorite. At the end of her workshop, people always are different. They look different. On Zoom, we could see that they look different. You can see that they are lighter because they've been able to release some emotions that they've held through really simple movements. So Kathy, congratulations. I think it's really interesting your perspective on grief. So tell us how you were able to turn this interest into grief into this really unique offering to support those who are grieving. Well, for, thanks, Denise. First of all, I just want to say that also I'm honored to have, and surprised to have been a winner and just really honored to be among this group of people here tonight who accomplished and dedicated people. Um, so, well, as you know, I was um, a caregiver for a friend who passed away in 2017, and I started being involved on in your programs and doing um, text chats and, and grief groups and that kind of thing. And I saw this opportunity from Paul Denniston, who had developed something called grief yoga, to become a grief movement specialist. Now, I'm, I have to say that I live in a town where there's a yoga studio on every block, and I'm the only person in town who didn't do yoga till, till they were, you know, 60. But, but nonetheless, uh, I thought, well, this sounds really interesting. And I knew I couldn't do grief yoga, but I was very interested in what he offered called grief movement, which involved um, a seated yoga, basically using movement, breath, and sound to release emotions. Um, what he says, which I think is very catchy, is that there are issues in your tissues and that the grief settles in your, in your tissues and that you need a way to release them. And so that's sort of how I got interested in it. And I, you know, I as I said, not really physically active that much, not really a yoga person, but I tried it and it was so helpful to me that I just went on and did both levels of training and then started offering workshops. And it's really, as you said, it's really amazing to just watch people respond to the workshops. Okay, so which movements would you like to lead us through? 
I'm trying to think. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think if you don't mind, I'll just give you a sample. So what happens within a grief movement workshop is that we go through a flow of movements that take you from, you know, basically being grounded to experiencing the grief and releasing the grief to uh, feeling empowered and feeling love at the end. So I just want to maybe take you through three like examples of those, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so one thing we do we do say to people also is you can be on camera or not depending on your comfort level because basically we just want people to enjoy it and it doesn't matter if you want to be seen or not. But so your choice. Um, so I invite you to uh, get comfortable in your chair um, and just uh, feel the ground under your feet. Um, feel your sit bones in your chair. You just take a deep breath in. A deep breath out. Sometimes it helps if you count the breath in, so you could count into a breath of three. Count, breathe out to a count of four. Do that one more time. Breathe in. And breathe out. At this point, I would usually go through a series of loosening up body parts, but tonight I'm gonna to concentrate on shoulders. So the exercise for releasing tension in your shoulders is to um, bring loose fists up in front, in front of your body and scrunch your shoulders up to your ears as tight as you can. Breathe in and breathe out and release your shoulders. Let's try that again. Breathe in, scrunch. Breathe out. We'll do one more. Breathe in and breathe out. You'll give your shoulders a roll if you want. That's where the yoga part comes in, right? So then we usually move on to a section of um, dealing with the emotions you might feel when you're grieving. And one of the things that I think is one of the exercises that's really the easiest but most powerful is the why exercise. So I invite you to raise your hands in front of you like this and just ask why, why, why? You might be asking, why am I a caregiver? Why is there not more support for family caregivers? Why can my carry not get more help? Why am I the only person in my family helping? Why any of those things? And it's really therapeutic, I think, to just keep asking why as long as you want. You know, sometimes I sit at my desk at work and just ask why. <laughs> um, so that's that's one of the ways that we release those emotions. And there's some others around there. Um, then, then when we get to the sort of restorative phase, I'm going to invite you all to um, put your hands in front of you, cuff your hands in front of you and uh, close your eyes. And I invite you to envision a time when you felt confident. So think about what that looked like. Where were you? Who were you with? Uh, what did it sound like around you? What did it smell like around you? What did it feel like around you? How did it feel for you? What was happening for you? What emotions were you feeling? And try to think of a really concrete example of that. And when you have that memory, say yes, and bring your hands into your heart and breathe that memory in. And when you're ready, just open your eyes. And I often do this with different, um, different scenarios, when you felt loved, when you felt confident, when you felt successful, when you felt powerful. And then often we end with the idea that, um, that you need to remember that basically you can give yourself a hug anytime you want. Um, that when you give yourself a hug, you're releasing oxytocin, the same as, as if someone else was giving you a hug. That's the right word, right? Not the drug, right? Okay. Yes, <laughs> I get confused on that. Uh, oxytocin. And, um, you know, sometimes there's nobody around to hug you, especially during COVID, there was nobody around to hug us. So it was really helpful to give ourselves a hug. And remember, we could do that. 
So thank you for trying those out. Yeah. But what's interesting is those movements that have helped me at times when I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? So I had a period of time where I was waking up in the middle of the night around three or four. So I did a little research, what wakes you up in the middle of the night between three and four, and it's grief, sadness. And so when I would wake up, knowing that it was grief or sadness, I would think, you know what, I could hug myself. So I would just hug myself in bed and it was really comforting and powerful. And I fall back asleep. Isn't that interesting? So, and I know that from you, Kathy. So thank you for my better night's sleep. Well, thank you for using it, Denise. <laughs> you know, one of the things that you've brought up too is that, you know, grief is not just about losing a person. It's also, there's all sorts of ways we experience grief as caregivers and people who work with caregivers. So it's really important to apply those things to any situation. And we have archived conferences and workshops where Kathy has done 25 minutes of our of her grief movement. So you can always go to it's Carrying Our Way is our community and we keep our archives there. So you can go to Carrying Our Way and look in our Caring Conference section and you'll see archives for our previous meetings. And Tara was one of our presenters, I think in March, 2022, I think. Okay. All right, Kathy, can you put your website address in the chat room? I, I can do that. Yes. And thank you guys so much for being here tonight. We are finishing on time. It was so lovely and wonderful and inspiring to spend this time with all of you. And please keep us posted on your work. And I want to mention Kathy's website address if you'd like to learn more about her work around grieving. It's care grieveheal.com. So three words, all one word. Okay. Thanks you guys so much. Congratulations. Thank you for making our world better through your work. Want to let you know that we see it, we appreciate it, and we are grateful for it. Okay. Thanks everyone.